Today, I want to talk to you about blessed are the gatekeepers. Blessed are the gatekeepers. And when we look in the scriptures, uh, we see what a gatekeeper is. Of course, in business, gatekeeper is somebody that protects someone else from phone calls, from access, uh, controls things. Today, I want us to talk about being a gatekeeper as it relates to family. And we'll be do, doing that starting here in Ephesians chapter 6. And let's just go there. And <clears throat> I think this must have been a Mother's Day message for the Apostle Paul. And the reason I think that is because Mother's Day is always such a challenging day for a pastor to preach because you're given two options, one a little pep talk and a thank you talk to all of the moms. Or you come in like I do every Sunday and tell people how to live and how to go after God. And so there's, you know, whenever you tell somebody how to do something better, that means that wherever it is they're at, there's room for improvement. The last thing I want to do is tell a mom how she needs to do her job better on Mother's Day. Paul must have had the same problem. Listen to this in Ephesians chapter 6. Notice who's conspicuously absent. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, one of the great passages of the Bible. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Can I get an amen from a mom or dad in the house today, right? Yeah, that's a good one to start this thing off with. And then here comes a promise. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. So the first commandment that comes along with a promise, and I know it's true. I know it's true 100%. I've seen it happen over and over. Here's a, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. You know how I know that? Because I've said this and I've heard this. I've heard this. I've looked at my kids when they weren't doing what I wanted them to do and I've said, boy, I brought you into this world. Okay, sorry, Blake. Girl, <laughs> I brought you into this world. Good move, by the way. I can take you out, right? Or what I heard my dad say one time was, son, go on outside. I don't want to get blood on your mama's carpet. I heard that. <laughs> Whew. If you take care of mama and you take care of daddy, things are going to be easier on you. But if you want to go to the school of hard knocks, hey, pick your poison. We can do it. We can do it. I'm more hard headed than you. Mom, dad, you're more hard headed. Be more hard headed than your kids. Look, let me just tell you something really quickly. This is just a bonus, not a part of my message really quick, but I, I want to share it. As teenagers, you look at your parents and you think that you're being raised by the most clueless human being on the planet. Like they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're, some of you are like looking right at your parents right now. I'm just gonna try not to make eye contact with you. Let me tell you what's gonna happen. At some point, you will grow and you will realize that you will value your parents for what they tried to give to you. A Little bit of time will take care of some of that stuff. You know, it's easy for somebody who's never been on a battlefield to go out and celebrate, and talk about what they're gonna do. But your mom and dad have been on the battlefield for a little bit. They've seen what works. They see what don't, doesn't work. And you know what? They want the best for you. But if you want to make it hard on them, hey, mom, dad, I want to just give you permission. Be as hard-headed as you can with those kids to get that down deep in their heart, right? So anyway, this passage here in Ephesians, as we close out our series in Ephesians, it's just instruction. It's instruction on the family. That's what it is, instruction on the family. And then we're going to go over here and we're going to look... Uh, we're going to look at the limitations. But before we get over there, I want you to understand today that moms and dads are the great gatekeepers of the family. Moms and dads are the great gatekeeper of the family. Say that with me. Moms and dads are the great gatekeepers of the family. Lamentations chapter five. Here's what the Bible says. <clears throat> By the way, what's the name of this book? Lamentations. This is a lament. What is a lament? When you lament something, it's a regret. I wish I hadn't done this. There's heartbreak associated here. The, the scriptures aren't designed for us always to be in celebration. There is a time, the Bible says, Ecclesiastes says, there is a time for joy, there's a time for laughter, but also there's a time for weeping. 
And so Lamentations has a reason here to weep. And here's what it says. Here's why the lament is going. Lamentations chapter 5, verse 14. The elders are gone from the city gate. Let me just say really quickly, when the elders abandon the city gate, the city is going to have problems. When the elders stand and fight at the city gate, the city will be blessed. Now that doesn't mean that just because you go to the gate and you keep the city, you keep the house, you keep the church, you keep, keep your community, doesn't mean that the enemy isn't going to come to the city gate. It just means you're going to be there to confront the enemy when he comes. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean the enemy says, you know what, look at all, uh, you know, look at, look at Greg, look at, look at Gail, look at Travis. They love Jesus. I'm going to leave them alone. No, the enemy still wants to get into the city. But the elders are gone from the city gate. The young men have stopped their music. Joy is gone from our hearts. Our dancing has turned to mourning. The crown has fallen from our head. Why is that? Because the city's been taken. Woe to us, for we have sinned. What, what did we do? We stopped upholding the values of the kingdom, the values of the city at the city gate where it needs to be upheld. You know what? I've heard all kinds of people, even recently, people saying, no, we are committed to God's word. Yeah, that might be what's on the wall, but are you defending what's on the wall at the city gates? That's a question. A lot of people can say, they love Jesus. A lot of people can say they stand on the word of God, but when the enemy shows up, are we going to stand? Anyway, because of this, our hearts are faint. Because of these things, our, our eyes grow dim. This is a really good word. Depending on the um, translation, you can see it a little bit better, but it basically says in verse 14 that when the elders are gone from the city gate, if they are gone, then in verse 17, then the children of the elders' eyes will grow dim. They won't be able to see as clearly. They won't understand as clearly. Mom, dad, I love you. Happy Mother's Day. But stand at the gate. Stand at the gate. There's a blessing for standing at the gate. But pastor, it's hard. I know. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. You know, if it was easy, you wouldn't have, you, there, there would be no fights. But the reason we're needed at the gate is because the enemy wants to come into the city. Let, let's just talk a little bit here about city gates in the Bible. We see that the city gates were the center of city life. We see that this was a place for counsel. This was a place for leadership. This was a place for judgment to take place. The officials would sit in the city gate. When we understand the, the impact of the city gates on the city, then we'll have a better understanding of a number of scriptures in the Bible. Consider these stories. When the angels of the Lord arrived in Sodom, that wicked city, who was it that was at the city gates? Lot was at the city gates. He had, was in a place of influence over that wicked city. He was an influential judge. We see in the scriptures that, when, that parents of a rebellious son that wouldn't submit to their discipline, they were told to take him to the city gate uh, and present him to the elders there. We see that Boaz... The great Boaz, that when he fell in love with Ruth and he redeemed Ruth, that he went to the city gate to settle his legal matters, to, pr to prove that he uh, was uh, right to marry Ruth. We see that when a soldier arrived at Shiloh and reported that the Philistines had stolen the Ark of the Covenant, it was there that Eli, the great leader, who had neglected his duty, actually, in a panic, fell over backwards, fell and broke his neck at the city gate. This is where he learned this. This is where the word was taken to him. We, say that, we see that King David stood by the city gate like William Wallace riding back and forth on his horse, painted blue faith, get, faith, face, giving last minute instructions to his army as they were getting ready to go up against Absalom and the people that had rose up in rebellion against David. And then we see that after Absalom's death, David returned to his place at the gate and the people came to him. So city gates are where people go to lead, they go to judge, they go to counsel. Now you can think of a few city gates around town, of course, the church. When there's a crisis, when there's a challenge, many times people call the church, they seek counsel, that's good. 
You know, City Hall can be this place. The police department can be this place. Hey, the hickory pit can be this place. How many times have we settled big matters, very important matters, you know, over a barbecue sandwich right here in town, right? In city gates, all kinds of important things happen at these places of influence. So I want you to understand this. Because the battle for our family and the battle for our church and the battle for our city is going to take place place at the gates, at the gates of our home, at the gates of the church, at the gates of the city. Now, can I just talk to you just for a second? Just as a pastor, can I just talk some? Come on, go ahead and tell me I can. All right. Come on, one more time. So go ahead, pastor. I'm going to do it anyway. I just was egg me on a little bit, right? I don't like it when I hear people talking bad about my city. I just don't like it. I don't like it. You don't like the city? We got two interstates, I-10, I-65. Hey, listen, you can jump on bloody 98. It doesn't take you long to get out of town, you know? You don't like the city? Leave it. That's just me. Are there some things you don't like? Of course. What do we do about those things? We go to the city gate and we talk about it. We get them fixed, right? The city isn't perfect, but this is our city. I don't like it when I hear people talk about the church. I don't like it. This is the Lord's church. This is the bride of Christ. What makes you think that you're better than the church that you can talk down about the church? Don't do that. Don't do that in my church. You know what? Don't do that about the church down the road. Sometimes people come from another church and badmouth the other church it came from. I'm like, Joker, you're talking about the bride of Christ. You're talking about my brothers and sisters. Are there things you don't like? Maybe your personality doesn't fit. Maybe a certain style, whatever. Look, but we're the bride of Christ. I'm going to stand at the city gate. And when good, well-meaning people come along and talk trash about the body of Christ, you know what? I can't help it. I'm going to be as kind as I can, but I'm going to defend the church. Talk about my family. The enemy comes against my family. You know what I'm going to do? Tanya, let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to roll up on the enemy and I'm going to dot his eye. I'm just going to go ahead. I I may not fight fair. I'm going to do everything I can because it's my family. This stuff happens at the city gate. Now go with me to Psalm chapter 127. Let's look at verse, let's look at verse three. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. Children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the the womb is a reward. Listen, your children are a reward. Right now you're thinking, can I survive my children? Any mamas and daddies that haven't slept in a little while because you got little kids. You're not just surviving it. Let me just tell you something. That's part of the reward. Oh, Lord. (laughs) Pastor, help me. No, you're gonna, what's gonna happen is your kids are gonna grow up, they're gonna mature, and you're gonna think about how wonderful it was to smell that baby's hair, to have that little baby throw up on you, to see that baby learn how to, how to walk, that little baby. That little baby, have you noticed how babies look drunk? They're wobbling around. They got that saggy diaper, they're just holding on to the coffee table, just trying to make it, right? Walking around like Frankenstein. I mean, it's crazy, their coordination is terrible, like a baby giraffe. You seen a baby giraffe try and walk? It's, it's crazy, you're sleep deprived, tired, broke. I remember bragging, I was like, I have never had one of these kids poop on me, our kids. Yeah, I'm changing diapers and stuff. Don't ever say that. That lasted one day. One day, I think the Lord was like, I'm going to fix your little red wagon. You know, he hooked me up. Let me say, your children are a reward. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall, oh, listen to this. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Did you see that? Did you see that just right there? The the enemy wants to stop that from happening. The enemy wants to stop your children from joining you at the gate. You know, when you've given your life to your kids and you've worked hard 
and you've gotten older and you get older and older, you get a little slower, your energy wanes, your eye dims, and you're doing everything that you can to keep moving your life forward, here's what the enemy doesn't want to have happen. As your energy is dropping, the energy and wisdom of your children, the faith of your children is rising. And when you think that you're failing and you see the enemy coming up the road, the enemy does it. Here's what he doesn't want. He doesn't want to see your sons and your daughters rolling up with you and say, don't worry, pops, I got this one. You've been fighting for me my whole life. Let me take care of your light work. When they roll up full of faith and full of strength, after you've given everything that you have to them, after you've prayed for them, after you've given your life and your heart and your blood and your sweat and your tear and money and money and money and money and lots of money and lots of time and you've been driving to soccer and you've been taking them to church and they're like, Daddy, do I have to go to church? And you're like, no, baby, you don't have to go to church. You get to go to church. But Daddy, I don't want to go to church. Sucker, as long as you live under my roof, roof, as long as you sit at my table, as long as you eat my food, as long as you breathe my air, you're going to go to the house of the Lord. You've been doing all those fights and you're going, I don't even know if this is working. And then the enemy comes up and then these young whippersnapper full of the Holy Spirit, strong in the Lord jokers that you raised that carry your DNA and your heart for the kingdom that you didn't know it was all in them, suddenly they, they rise up to the occasion and they say, you don't talk to my dad like that. You don't talk to my mom like that. You're not coming in this city. We're raising our own kids right now and we, they step up with you. That's what the enemy doesn't want. See, here's what the enemy doesn't do typically. He typically doesn't try and cut down oak trees. What he tries to do is he tries to mow over little saplings and little seedlings. If the enemy can stop our faith while it's in formation, that, that's his best shot at disrupting this thing. Look, the enemy is afraid of what happens when, at the gate when the children join the gatekeeper. The enemy hates your children. The enemy doesn't want to see faith arise in your children. He wants to take your children out before they're formed. Listen, I declare over the families of Pathway Church that you will raise strong men and women of the gospel. I speak it. We pray for, oh, pastor, shouldn't we just trust the sovereignty of the Lord? Yes, we trust the sovereignty of the Lord, but the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So you keep on praying. You keep bending your knee. You keep going into the word. You keep standing in the gap for your children is the enemy wants to take them out you know a spirit-filled mother a spirit-filled father faithful at the gate is a force and when you stand there you're standing in the gap for more than just yourselves more than just your family you're standing in the gap for your church for your city let me tell you something if your family loves Jesus if you're going after Jesus with everything you have and you keep going after him, and you keep defending the kingdom, you keep establishing the kingdom in your household. Let me tell you, your church is gonna be blessed. There'll be other people inspired by your courage, inspired by your commitment to Christ. You're inspired by your passion to Christ, and the church will be built. So mom, dad, keep taking your kids to the throne. Baby, keep taking, keep ta taking our two girls to the throne. Keep taking Blake to the throne. Dr. Toke. Keep taking your two kids to the throne of God. Doherty, keep taking your kids to the, keep taking your son. You got kids now. You got one married in, right? Uh, keep, Chad, Pastor Chad over at airport campus, keep taking those two twin boys of yours and that beautiful little girl to the throne room of God. Pathway Church, don't quit. Don't get tired. Keep going. Keep going. Keep knocking. Keep asking. Keep praying, keep attending, keep worshiping, keep working, keep disciplining, do all the things that you know to do. And June, when you've run out of tools, stand. And that's when God shows up there at the gate. We're not quitting. Don't get tired. Don't get weary. Don't get bamboozled by the lies of the latest pop cultural, you know, psycho fad you trust the word of God. You know, I sure am thankful for our schools. I'm so thankful for our schools. I'm thankful for our principals. I'm thankful for our counselors. Thankful for our teachers. I'm thankful for our, 
workplaces. I'm thankful for our police officers, for our mayors, for our city councilmen, for business leaders around the community, influencers in the community. But not one of those jokers is responsible for standing in the gate for your kids. You are responsible. You're responsible. And this is the book that we go to. This is what we lean on. So keep fighting at the gate. If we keep fighting, we'll reap. If we don't, faint. Now, let me let you in on a little strategy of the enemy because we know the enemy wants our house. Here's what he do. Here's what he does. He wants your home. He wants your things. He wants to plunder your goods. He wants your people. He wants your dreams. He wants your future. He wants your destiny. He wants to steal the innocence of your children. He, he wants to, dis, you know, sometimes he doesn't destroy. Sometimes he just distracts a little bit. He, he wants to do all of these things. He wants to wreak havoc in your home. He wants to just destroy your, your, your things, your home, your plan. Yes, Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. What does he come to do? He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, here it is. I want you to go with me to Matthew chapter 12, and listen, here's the strategy. Here's his tactics. Verse 29, here's what Jesus says. Jesus says, or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder the house? So Satan has to do first things first as well. If he does second things before he does first things, he's gonna be in trouble. Mom, And dad, in this house, in the kingdom of God, in your house, I'm afraid that the enemy has made some tactical errors for those of you that are sitting here. I'm assuming if you're sitting here, you want God's kingdom to come in your house. Is that true? Is that true? Come on, is that true? Uh, That's my assumption. And if you're here, if you're here, and the enemy is working havoc in your family. It seems to me that he started the plundering before he started the binding. How many of you love Jesus today? How many of you want God's best in your life? How many of you want God's best for your family? Well, he tried to loot your house. He tried to plunder your house. You're still standing. What do we do? We pick up the sword of the Lord We pick up the word of God. We walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Look, he might have gotten on in. Have have you had the enemy work some challenges in your life and in your family? Absolutely. There's nobody in here that hasn't faced something, isn't facing something. I'm not here to talk about how perfect we are. I'm not here to shame anybody. I'm just here to talk about the perfect one and how we engage him in our home. So here's what we do. Here's what we do. If the enemy has slipped in the city gate when you weren't looking, maybe you're away, maybe you're distracted, maybe you've sinned, maybe you were passive. Let me, let me just say really quickly, one of the greatest problems today is a passive absent father or a passive absent mother. We're there, but we're not there. Maybe we're not in the house at all, but maybe we're there and we're just not there. Well, listen, wake up, wake up. Let's get back in this thing. Pastor, I I don't really know. I I, I don't don't know what to do. You get in the fight right now. If you missed it yesterday, don't worry about yesterday. Let's just get in it today. And we pick up our sword and we run to where the enemy is inside the gates and we grab that joker by the scruff of the neck and we drag him down Main Street and roll up to the, now I left the gate. Kelly's over there at the gate. Kelly's at the gate. I left the gate. I'm walking up. Hey, baby, I'm coming. I got this joker. Open the gate. Open the gate. Hurry up. Open the gate. She opens the gate. I throw that joker out. Next thing I know, Kelly's gone over there, and she, she's got him in a headlock. She, she's punching him in the face, and I'm like, don't mess with my woman. And I'm kicking him in the side. We're just going after him. And we said, then don't come back. I just don't. I think it's unrealistic to think that the enemy's not going to get in the gate, but it's our job to be in the gate. We gotta fight for their future. Fight for their destiny, fight for their mind. Fight for their spirit, fight for their faith. 
We get in this fight. Our family belongs to the Lord. Our city belongs to the Lord. Our children belong to the Lord. This church belongs to the Lord. Fight for your church. Fight for your Lord, for your Savior. I'm not talking about getting down into some culture war to make people think like we think. That's not what I'm talking about. But what I'm saying is, hey, if you want to go and serve the God of the Amorites or you want to go and serve the God of the Jebusites, that's fine. But as for me and my house, we're serving the Lord. We're going to serve the Lord. You want to bring that nonsense into my house, into my family, into my church? I promise you, now you got a fight on your hands. Hey, I'm not going to go pick a fight with you, but if you bring the fight to me, hey, Jerry Anderson, I'm going to get in a fight, man. I'm just going to get in a fight. Somebody's going to be like, hey, somebody pull pastor off of that guy. He's had enough. He's had enough. And you know what? It's not just going to be, hey, we got to pull pastor off. We got to pull Todd off. We got to pull all kinds of people off. We're not going to fight fair. Once we get the enemy on the run, let's just whoop that joker on down and make a convincing victory all the way, all the way. Now, that's a good pep talk. Let's talk about how we do this for real. Some, some practicals here. Okay. Number one, here's what I want you to do. I want you to be aware of the authority that we have here's such a thing that the enemy has done is he has convinced us and hidden truth from us uh, so that we are not taking advantage of the authority that God has already given us. I was watching this movie, Hidden Figures. And in Hidden Figures, is it Kevin Cosner, right? I think it's Kevin Cosner there. And uh, one of the mathematicians, I can't remember her name, but she was one of the first engineers there at NASA, one of the first African-American engineers there at NASA. And he was trying to figure out if she was able to go into the Pentagon for the briefing. And he was told, he, he, he said, well, who, who's the boss? Who's in, ch- in charge of who goes in there? And she said, well, you are. You just have to act like it. <laughs> oh, I like that. I like that right there. Listen, you do not understand who you are and the authority that you have. You've been putting up, we've been putting up for too much with too much for too long. Why are we doing it? Because we don't understand the authority we're walking. Listen to this, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 and 19. Here's what Jesus says. He says, uh, the scripture says, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying, here's what he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Then he turns to us and he says, Go, therefore, and make disciples. In his authority, he says, you've got the power, you've got the authority, you go. And of course, we see that we're then empowered by the Holy Spirit. When you walk, June, when you walk, Carl, you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Look, I look at you, I admire you for all you've done. Blake, I admire you for what you do, but it's so much bigger than you. It's the Holy Spirit of God living in you, living in us. Act like it. Straighten up, square your shoulders back. You're not walking and you, you may feel insecure, but you have no need to feel insecure because we walk in the power of God. Secondly, stand in authority at the city gate. Stand in authority at the city gate. Pastor, you don't understand. That's nice for you to say. There's some really nice Christian families here, but my family is messy. And you know what? My past, I've got some problems. I, I don't even feel right. Stepping into that role, stepping into that role of leadership. I mean, can I be honest? My kids heard me cuss like three days ago. They saw my wife yelling at me. They, they saw all kinds of mess, all kinds of chaos. And now you want me to step into a role of spiritual authority? You know what my kids are going to say? My kids are going to say, Dad, you're a hypocrite. I'm not listening to you. you, you know, let, me just, let me give you some pastoral counsel. Just go ahead and own it. Just go ahead and own it. Say, it's true. I said those things and I'm so embarrassed that I said those things. And yeah, you know, your mom, you know, she gets crazy sometimes. And <laughs> we, we, we got, we're, we're not perfect. But thank God that every man and woman that was used by God in this book, except for the man, Jesus Christ, had problems themselves. And so if God can use David, he can use me too. So baby, you get to this table. We're gonna sit down and we're gonna eat. We're gonna sit down and we're gonna talk. We're gonna sit down and we're gonna pray. And you know this whole thing about you telling me whether or not you wanna come to church, whether you feel up to it, that conversation is over, baby. I love you, but get your butt in the car. We're going to church. 
So we stand in that authority. We walk in that authority at the city. Go ahead and own it. And then give, give your kids a hug. Tell them you love them. And keep going at when you fail, when you mess up, apologize to them. If the standard is for you to be perfect, you'll never live up to it. He's perfect. Let them see God's grace. Don't go on sinning. Don't let God's grace be an excuse for you to go on sinning. Pathway Church, stop sinning. Stop it. Stop lying. Stop cheating. Stop arguing. Stop fighting recklessly. Stop being angry and sinning. Stop letting the sun go down on your wrath. Commit your heart to Jesus. Go after him. And when you come up short, Tanya, just come right back in. Let's get back into the game. You know what? We're not mad at anybody in this place. And we're not going to be mad at one another in the family. We're just going to invite Jesus right up into the middle of this whole thing. And, and a couple things about that. Mom, dad, you're doing a whole lot better than you think you are. You're, you're doing a whole lot better. And the second thing is that when we bring God into the situation, we together stand at the city gate. It's just not me out at the city gate. It's me and Jesus. And Jesus plus Travis is a majority all day long. And when God gets involved, anything can happen. Third, in the power of the Holy Spirit, let the righteous in the gate and block the unrighteous from going out of the gate. So listen, Practically, there might be some friends that you need to cut out from your family's lives, right? There might be some TV programs that don't need to be being shown in your home. There might be some devices. Now, you got to get a handle on this. I think it's interesting here. Let me take this sucker out of... Would you look at that? See what that is? What is that? Maybe I can turn it. It's an apple. You can't see it on this, right? It's an apple with a little bite out of it. Man, I need this thing, but boy, some temptations and problems and access on this thing. Mom, dad, you stand at the city gate and you decide what comes in and you decide what goes out. If you got to get your kids a flip phone, get them a flip phone. If you got to get them a pterodactyl that a, a, a peck on a stone tablet, a message that they sent to their friend, you do that, you know? I mean, I ain't have a phone until Kelly and I were almost married when I got a phone. And they're not going to die if they can't text somebody. If they text it, their thumbs are going to fall off. You determine what comes in the city gate. And then finally, live at the gate the life you want to see inside the city. We can't tell people what to do that we won't go ahead and, and do ourselves. Let's live it.